All right, I'm back. All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody. We look like it looks like we have a really great um, showing for for our Zoom uh, or our virtual uh, grand rounds. And uh, my name is Rita Henderson, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Cummings School of Medicine here and I've been faculty lead for now over two years of the, the group for research with Indigenous People for Health, we call GRIP at, in the O'Brien Institute. And um, there's a, a number of quick changes I wanted to just note in, in some of our organization and activities before passing it off to great colleagues, very um, welcome to, to share important research today. So uh, the GRIP, we've historically had a number of activities in pulling diverse Indigenous community partners and researchers together. Um, some of you may be familiar with the, the newsletter that we had um, ongoing for, for several years. We've sort of pulled back with that lately because there are other entities that are producing important um, newsletters. So if you're new to Indigenous health, I encourage you to turn to uh, the IPHCPR, which is the Indigenous uh, Primary Health Care Policy and Research Network. So IPHCPR.ca is um, a website that you can visit and there's under news, you can sign up for, for a newsletter and regularly receive um, information. There's also at Alberta Health Services, the Indigenous Wellness Corps, and um, Keenan Williams there produces a very valuable set of um, uh, listserv information. And, and you can uh, reach out at indigenous.health at ahs.ca. I'd also like to congratulate uh, my mentor and our colleague, Dr. Lindsay Croshu, in his new role as Assistant Dean Indigenous here at the Cummings School of Medicine, which is really exciting to have more formalized leadership in this area. And, uh, and today, even though she's she's well known in our in our midst, I'd like to formally welcome Dr. Pamela Roach as a colleague now, an assistant professor also in family medicine, joining us for very important work in in this area. So I'll pass it over to, to Dr. Roach now to introduce our guests and um, and she'll help um, moderate the questions after. So thank you everybody for joining us. It looks like an important and, and valuable audience here today. Thank you, um, Dr. Henderson, and thank you for that lovely welcome and introduction. Um, I feel like I've been part of the O'Brien and uh, Cummings School of Medicine family for quite some time, but nice to be here in a formal way. Uh, and welcome to all of our, our attendees today. Um, I can see that we've got over 150 people on the line right now, so that's a fantastic turnout. Uh, I'm really very honored to be able to moderate today's session on anti-racism in emergency care, reflecting on results from an ongoing mixed methods project. And before I introduce our, our very um, valuable speakers that we're, we're very like lucky to have you join us today, uh, I do want to acknowledge that we are, of course, on the traditional and present day territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. This includes the, back, the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pagani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. And of course, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, of which I am a member. So welcome um, on my behalf as well. So I'm very pleased you're all here to join us in this important discussion. As Dr. Henderson mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the departments of family medicine and community health sciences here. And joining us today, we have Patrick McLean, uh, who is a health services researcher and assistant scientific director of the Emergency Strategic Clinical Network. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Alberta and is an adjunct assistant professor of emergency medicine also at the University of Alberta and is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research through which he's developed a mixed methods program of research examining models of emergency care and care across health systems. So this program addresses current issues impacting emergency departments, including anti-Indigenous racism, opioid use disorder and COVID-19 with a focus on outcomes for underserved and populations um, experiencing marginalization. So we are also joined by Bonnie Healy. Uh, Bonnie is a registered nurse from the Kainai Nation Blood Tribe. She is the health director of the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the immediate past chair of the board of directors for the National First Nations Information Governance Center. Bonnie's experience and expertise in First Nations information systems gives her a clear understanding and strong passion for using data as a tool 
for change and giving voice to First Nations leadership, right to self-determination, control, and jurisdiction in reliable research and accurate statistics. So we're absolutely very fortunate to have this expertise with us today, and we look forward to the discussion. Just before we start, I'll just remind attendees to use the Q&A box to post your questions, which will be addressed um, at the end of the presentation. Remember that you can upvote questions so that if, if some you see somebody post a question that you also would like answered, you can vote for that to go up to the top. Uh, we will be recording the webinar. If you have any follow-up questions or don't get your questions answered, just feel free to email the O'Brien Institute at IPH at ucalgary.ca and they will connect you to the speakers and get your questions answered. So on that note, I will uh, hand the floor over to Patrick and Bonnie. Thanks. Thanks so much, Pam and Rita for the introduction. Um, so we'll tag team on this presentation. I'd like to say um, I'm presenting from Edmonton here in Treaty 6 territory. And we're going to talk about our ongoing mixed methods project on quality of care for First Nations persons in emergency departments in Alberta. This is work that we'd started together in 2016 with, with a number of partners that we'll discuss as we go forward. Uh, oh, I can introduce myself really quickly. Oki, Idami Situko, Nistoranago, Kapoyaki, Nostoto Agenai, Nanixis Mamuik, Nanidan Agaxamax. I'm uh, Bonnie Keeley, Health Director for Blackfoot Confederacy, also a, a partner on this project. And I am um, in presenting from my home community of uh, Ghana Nation. Thanks, Bonnie. Would you like to um, speak to your affiliations, your grants? Sure. Um, I have a um, number of grants uh, within the Blackfoot of Confederacy. So I am, I've got funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, to look at opioids and some of the opioid data from the First Nations opioid reports that are available within Ministry of Alberta Health and AFNIGC. I also have um, funding from the Canadian Institute of Health Research in partnership with the First Nations Health and Social Secretariat in Manitoba with the iHealth agreement. Thank you. And um... Much of the research we present today will be is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Another uh, influential affiliation I have is with the Emergency Strategic Clinical Network of Alberta Health Services. And so we want to talk about why emergency care is a unique context for anti-racist work. To understand the public health role of emergency care in the context of wider health and social systems and to look at what practice changes and systemic changes would allow the system to better serve First Nations patients. So we have two studies we'll draw on for our presentation. Uh, one here was funded by AHS, the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Center and Mosque Wichis Health Services, as well as a, a small grant from Campus Alberta. And then the current study is understanding and defining quality of care in the emergency department with First Nation members. And that is funded by CIHR for three years and now four years with the pandemic. We have another number of important partners, Moscow Health Services, Yellowhead Tribal Council, Treaty 8 Organization of First Nations of Alberta, um, Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakota Tsitsina Tribal Council, um, the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Center is a main partner. Leah Bill as their executive director co-leads all of our decisions for the project. Uh, the University of Alberta, Alberta Health Services, University of Calgary and partners in Alberta Health. Um, Bonnie, I see your video is off. Would you, are you able to speak to this one? Um, oh. Yeah, I think that um, when we, um, approached First Nations a number of years ago. Uh, oh, there was great interest to really understand um, the experiences of their community members in the emergency department. And so we have some um, 
strong commitment from each nation to, and they've been involved. Um, I think the first uh, gathering we had was with, with their elders and the health technicians. And so the relationship is uh, fairly longstanding. And at this time, I was the um, executive director of AFNADC, um, but I've since transitioned uh, positions about a year and a half ago. We do have a large team and the support of partners and all of the organizations we've just mentioned, including emergency physicians and Bonnie as an emergency nurse. Um, we have an elder advisory that we review data with and those elders have been nominated by our partner organizations. And we're very happy to have had at our meetings at different times, Leonard Bastian, Helen Bull, Mary Crawler, Kina Jacobs, Lena Firth and Dustin Twain. And I, Bonnie, I think you were going to speak to OCAP. Sure. Um, so just a little bit of overview for those that aren't familiar with um, OCAP. It stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession of Information. And uh, this was uh, developed by a committee, which was the First Nations Information Governance Committee um, around the mid-90s. and. First Nations were really asserting uh, self-determination and governance over their own information. So a long-standing history is uh, First Nations generally don't own their own information. Um, it's housed within other uh, entities, provincial and federal governments and academia. And OCAP is really just moving and shifting in the research relationship where First Nations are really governing and telling their own story. So for the past 15 years, I've been working with the First Nations leadership, not only in Alberta, but also in Canada, and to really assert this, this um, shift in governance over information. And uh, the Assembly of First Nations have passed a resolution across Canada to support uh, OCAP um, in all research relationships and all data collection initiatives. And uh, Alberta uh, chiefs have also passed a resolution to support this uh, work and shift in governance. And we have a number of successful relationships that have OCAP actually with the World Health and uh, within the University of Calgary, uh, Faculty of Medicine, and the U of A, and uh, uh, the provincial government. And um, I think one of the greatest successes with, with OCAMP is there is a certification program within FNIGC. And Alberta, um, about three years ago, we uh, worked with the Ministry of Alberta Health Surveillance Unit and uh, secured funding to train over a thousand individuals, um, First Nations, uh, non-First Nation uh, researchers, uh, provincial and government, uh, federal government employees. So we've been fairly successful in really gaining that, that deeper understanding of OCAP and research relationship. Thank you. And so we're looking at racism in our project. That's been true since the, the start of the project. And so we've looked at the definition of racism from Patricia Jones, that racism is a system, that it structures policies, practices, and norms resulting in differential access to goods, services, and opportunities of society by race but also recognizing that we can approach the idea of racism with indigenous language perspectives and to gain understandings of experiences of racism in the healthcare system. And so I think many on this public health call will know that uh, worse health outcomes are consistently reported for First Nations people in Canada. And that's been linked to social, political and economic inequities as well as inequities in healthcare. Now, the role of emergency departments in that is that emergency departments are meant to be open 24-7 to all comers and to prioritize uh, 
treatment on the basis of medical need, uh, not on any other factors. So EDs have long functioned as a social safety net and with the triage system are in principle committed to equitable care. Uh, this is a slide um, I believe Bonnie will speak to. Hi, um, I'm just uh, multitasking. Uh, the um, access to primary care and ED use, so some of the uh, limited access to appropriate primary care um, drives uh, the ED department and some of the First Nations have limited access to primary care. And so what I wanted to just elaborate on, just because it, it, you know, over the years of working with Alberta Health Services and other physicians across Canada, it's not clearly understood that First Nations don't have fully funded primary care networks within their, within their uh, communities. And uh, we are really working and operating from two different health systems. So the federal jurisdiction and funding of health systems are primarily public health. And um, uh, there is home care dollars now that were made available due to regional health survey data that um, established a need for increased funding for home care on reserve and then increased funding for the Aboriginal Diabetes Initiative. So it was the regional health survey data that secured uh, extra funding for these programs. But um, the one, uh, there is only a policy within um, Canada that oversees First Nations health systems, and that's the First Nations health policy. So you can Google that. It was written in 1979 and has not been reviewed since then. Um, and so if um, we have any physicians um, and clinics working within communities, First Nations will work with the physicians in a um, using own source revenue to provide space, to provide those supports, um, but we don't have robust primary care networks within community. Yeah, and that'll be important context for some of the ED data we'll present. Um, and so we said emergency care is committed to equity in principle. There have been studies, many studies of race and ethnicity in emergency departments. Those studies have shown differences in triage and wait times, diagnoses in analgesia or pain control, leaving without being seen and against medical advice. And so with that in mind, and following literature that recommends unique approaches to indigenous healthcare, um, we would see a need for approaches that are tailored to the emergency department for Indigenous or First Nations healthcare. So we'll get in now to some statistical results. So what we've done is we've used a data set of all emergency department visits in the province from 2012 to 2017. So that's data for 111 facilities that includes some of the acute ambulatory care sites and urgent care centers. So this is over 11 million emergency visits by about 3 million people. So not everyone in the province uses ED in our five year period. And what we were surprised to find, and we're using Ministry of Health data, um, if you use different data sets, you'd get somewhat different numbers. But using Alberta data, First Nations people make up 4% of the provincial population, 4.8% of unique emergency patients, and 9.4% of the emergency department visits. So an incredibly important population for emergency care in the province. Um, and this is going to underestimate um, these numbers, because anyone who's come to the province after 2009, um, such as a First Nations person from Saskatchewan isn't counted. And um, there are some other limitations around that data set. Um, I, Patrick, I, I don't think um, this uh, demographic um, blurb really tells um, a good, gives a good understanding of the demographic age groups of First Nations that make up the 4%. So we generally have a younger population group. So our largest uh, um, girth of our population in a demographic pyramid would be the 15 to the 29 year olds. And so we, we don't, our older population is much smaller than the general public. Absolutely. 
And so when we age and sex standardize emergency care visit rates across the province, what we see, so the orange bars here are non-First Nations, blue First Nations. This is ED visits per person per year. So non-First Nations persons like myself would be visiting the emergency department about every two years on a provincial level, um, where it's closer to one and a half times per year for First Nations person. And that holds true in every zone, AHS zone of the province. So Calgary, Edmonton, as well as the rural areas. We also see surprising differences in uh, use of the emergency department by sex. So a much higher proportion of uh, First Nations emergency visits are by First Nations um, recorded as female in administrative data. And so important to look at the intersections of uh, sex and race or uh, identity. We also see that First Nations people, a greater proportion of the visits are to the community and smaller hospitals, as opposed to the major tertiary hospitals like the University of Alberta or the regional centers like Fort, Mac Fort McMurray, Lethbridge, Red Deer. Important transportation differences we were able to look at. So the way we've rolled this up is 25% of First Nations persons have to travel greater than 24 kilometers to the department closest to their home. Now, people aren't always going to emerge from their home, but it gives a sense of the, the distribution. And so for non-First Nations people, the same statistic is just eight kilometers. Um, and so there's reasons for that. Hospitals have been built over time in certain places. And then we look at uh, dispositions and these are really striking. So leaving without being seen, that third set of bars, much higher number of First Nations visits and without actually seeing the physician coming in and registering and not, not seeing a physician. Or again, a much bigger difference in leaving before discharge, before the care is complete from the hospital's perspective. And so we met with elders to co-interpret this data in June and October of 2019. So elders explained leaving without completing treatment in terms of issues accessing transport to and from the emergency department. So if you've only got a chance to, to get a ride home at a certain time, you may have to take it. Um, then there's discrimination within the healthcare system. And elders also talked about family responsibilities and possible need to leave there. Um, would you like to add, Bonnie? Um, no, I don't think I have a lot to add. I think it was just a really good conversation with the elders. Um, the elders had a lot to contribute um, and they wanted to tell a wholesome story. So if this is not just about um, targeting um, poor experiences. They also wanted to talk about some of the um, positive experiences uh, and um, the great care that they received while they were in these systems. Absolutely. And I should say that the issue of transportation was really as a researcher, as a Western researcher, not on my radar at all. Um, and it was the elders who pointed the, out the importance of that for us. And so it's very high value in engaging communities. This is an example of the discrimination component. This comes from an interview with a physician. And so the physician told the story about being a resident and she said she'd seen a, a First Nations girl who she was sure had appendicitis. And she says the quote here is that the physician, the person training her was quote, running her mouth about Indians, like going on a big racist rant. Um, some of our other data, we have examples of what those rants, um, the content, what they might be. And so the, the physician told us that this patient got up and she took the IV out of her arm and she was bleeding on the floor and she left. And she says, they don't know what happened to her. Another component of our project is we want to see are there different outcomes in the emergency department when we control for as many factors as we can. 
Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but if the slides are distributed afterwards, um, some of the information of the variables we've used are here. And so this is a forest plot. So again, First Nations blue, non-First Nations are the uh, orange triangles. And what we're seeing is the difference in the odds of being triaged is having an acute, so a really urgent emergency visit, um, triage levels one and two for First Nations versus non-First Nations for all of these different variables that we looked at. And you can see there's some big differences here. Overall, when we look at the entire data set, so anything further to the should be the right of your screen is going to be higher odds of acute triage. Um, we see First Nations persons arriving by ambulance are having a higher odds of acute triage. And really big differences at the pediatrics of the two children's hospitals in the province. Now, the ones I've got circled in red here, these are the cases when we look at people presenting to the emergency department for the same episode disease groups or even for the same diagnosis where we still see these differences hanging on. And we looked at that to be able to say whether um, some of these differences could be explained by um, different, basically different health conditions. And that was all planned analysis. So we were surprised to find that non-First Nations people from lower income areas seem to have slightly higher odds of acute triage. The reverse is true for First Nations persons. And then we see differences hanging on at the small and medium community hospitals, um, which again, First Nations persons rely on more. And it was really the small community hospitals where we see those differences for specific diagnoses. So these were health diagnoses that elders asked us to examine and our team members and community partners asked us to examine. And so if you're a First Nations person presenting to the, to the small community hospitals with spontaneous abortion, opioid-related visits, an acute upper respiratory infection or acute anxiety, the odds of acute triage are lower. And so we wonder if this is, this is exploratory data, but we wonder if this is evidence of bias. And if we think that bias is playing a role, it makes sense that we don't see differences in triage for long bone fracture. Uh, because it's pretty obvious if someone has a, a long bone fracture in many cases. So this is another quote. This is, this is from a nurse and she says, I would say as a general rule, as soon as we hear that there's an ambulance coming in from a specific nation and the participant named the nation, there's an assumption that it's going to be something silly coming in. So there's a, a perception before the patients even arrived in the emergency department, in some cases that this isn't going to be a medical emergency. Um, so triage is important. It determines how quickly you're seen and how quickly your medical issue is addressed. And for many medical conditions, time is of the essence. And so that bias could be playing a role alongside more use of the ED for, for more primary care reasons. And so these slide, this slide, it highlights three cases that have been in the media where First Nations individuals lost their lives. Um, Brian Sinclair, um, 34 hours in a Winnipeg emergency department. Uh, staff assumed he was intoxicated or homeless. No one um, had interacted with him or triaged him into the system. He passed away of an untreated bladder infection. Um, Keegan Coombs in British Columbia 2015 had accidentally ingested ethanol and while lab results showing that were available within three hours of the emergency department visit, those lab results were not looked at for another 12 hours. Um, his advocates had felt he also, there was a stereotyping that maybe he was being left to sleep it off and presumed to be intoxicated. Joyce Echequan, this isn't an ED case, but this is in, in Quebec of this year and subject to racist verbal abuse while dying and calling for help, restrained in a hospital bed 
And so what, what these cases raise for us is how many similar cases go unreported, how many similar cases are there where perhaps the individual doesn't die, but their care isn't what it should be um, because of biases and, and stereotyping. We may need to add to this list the case of Lily and Ashley in Hannah, Alberta, just, just very recently, uh, that's been profiled in APTN. Um, folks could look that up afterwards. Um, um, Patrick, I just maybe wanted to add a little bit when we were coordinating our presentation, um, I just wanted people to really not lose focus. These are really horrible stories. Um, but um, with Brian Sinclair case, the hospital of Winnipeg spent a, a very large amount of money um, to prove that racism wasn't um, at play within regards to his case. And um, where I, I'm more concerned is that we're actually missing the point is um, Brian Sinclair sat in this, this emergency waiting room and never once saw a healthcare worker. And um, just being a trained uh, ER nurse, and I know triage is not everybody's favorite spot to be when they're um, getting assigned to their areas within the emergency room. I so happen to love triage. Um, so I, I'm really, really, I really struggle with this case because um, I couldn't imagine going, you know, that many days and having somebody sit in my waiting room and not be seen by me as the triage nurse. I think that is the bigger concern, I think, for myself here, but um, definitely really sad cases. Yeah, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, and so, and we did want to talk about some of the First Nations participants' perspectives. So this was in our, our gathering we'd held um, with First Nations people from around the province uh, in 2018 in Edmonton. And so I, I was really moved. People talked about understanding that emergency care providers' work is difficult and stressful. So the patients are thinking about the providers. It was talking about the ED as a fast-paced environment the ED as part of a wider context. So there was talk about how the issues encountered in emergency care can be encountered anywhere that a patient encounters um, or that a First Nations person encounters a, a public service. There was talk that the ED is particularly a hard place. You're coming in in medical urgency. You're perhaps less able to advocate for yourself. And participants talked about experiences, so that lack of access to services like primary care driving the ED use. People talked about uh, stereotyping, uh, particularly around drugs and alcohol, and a perception of people misusing the emergency department. People talked about fears that child services would be called if they were taking their child or a child to the emergency department. There were stories of a lack of understanding of First Nations history and contemporary realities. One participant told the story of um, coming to the emergency department with her mother who uh, was on a number of antidepressants as a result of um, experiences in residential schools. And the participant talked about how troubling it was to be saying residential schools to a care provider who appeared to have no knowledge of, of what that was entailed or, or about residential schools. And then we also heard about an added source of anxiety in presenting to the emergency department. So, so as a white person, if I go to the emergency department and I feel I'm being left to wait or I'm having a negative interaction with someone, I might think that it's very busy or I'm not being taken seriously, but I don't have to worry that I'm getting negative care because of racism. And so some of the First Nations participants talked about, about racism as a ghost, as it's hard to prove it's there unless someone really says, um, you know, uses a, a racial derogatory term. Bonnie, would you like to, to add on here? <laughs> 
Um, well, I, I think when we um, when we were looking at some of the understandings as to why people would not go um, and you know past experiences or current situations, um, previous treatment, um, just not feeling safe in those environments, and um, I think uh, um, you know there there are a lot of things that. Um, just using the word racism, I think when we were first court, you know, getting together and we were establishing the title of our research and submitting our grant, um, there was a lot of concern over the use of the word racism. So I would always say it's not um, going to be wholly looked at in English context, but where we can, we will look at um, uh, experiences with Indigenous language and and sharing those experiences in the, in their language. Um, First Nations languages, like the Blackfoot language is the language I, I'm, I can speak from, is very descriptive. And so if I was trying to look at um, uh, maybe a word, Blackfoot word equivalent for racism, I would use the word is to gun not be, and that means my dirty looks, my tone, my wishes, my desires, my thoughts, my actions um, would all be to harm a human being. And um, there's accountability built into the language, so you can't, if you're being told that you are um, behaving in this way in in the Blackfoot language, you would have to own it. There's accountability already embedded into the language. It's so descriptive. Whereas with the English language, there's a lot of, um, we saw it with the Brian Sinclair case and the use of um, case law, where um, the proof, proving racism in English context is, um, is very difficult. Uh, it's um, with Western thinking, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. So I would always ask um, Western um, uh, thinkers and English language speakers to say, if you can't measure a dirty look, does that mean racism isn't there? So these are some of the contexts and the conversations we had when we were talking about this. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, Bonnie had just mentioned about persons not wanting to go to the emergency department. And so other qualitative literature um, has shown and, and our research backs up that there's an expectation of profiling and different treatment in the emergency department. So participants talked about uh, making sure to sort of put themselves together, put on nice clothes, um, perhaps put on makeup to go to the emergency department. Um, one participant talked about um, looking for an opportunity to mention their high status profession not in the hopes of getting better care, but just in the hopes of getting equal care to what others would get. And so people talked about hospital avoidance. We heard one participant talked about a brother who'd passed away without going to the emergency department um, or to the hospital because um, they didn't like the questions that are asked there. We also heard about concerns about specific hospitals, and this was interesting. So persons from around the province um, talked about this, that there's certain hospitals that they feel that they receive poor care in as First Nations people and wouldn't go to. And so people may be undertaking long drives to bypass the closest emergency department at a time of medical urgency to attend a, a department where they feel the care may be better for them. And so our findings are consistent with the BC provincial inquiry that's just been released. And this inquiry did a nice job of laying out some of the stereotypes that they found abound in healthcare. So they found stereotypes of Indigenous persons, and they, they weren't only considering uh, First Nations, but pan-Indigenous lens. A perception that First Nations people are less worthy of care, maybe drinkers or alcoholics or drug-seeking, a widespread set widespread perception of First Nations people as bad parents. And this, this phrase that gets used in the emergency department of frequent flyers um, 
So that report found a perception that patients may be misusing or overusing the health system in particularly, and they, they use the term emergency room. And they also found the emergency department as one of the places where racism is most reported in their healthcare system. I think in, in that slide, um, you know, I, there's, there needs to be a lot more understanding too. And um, I'm not too sure where you were gonna put it, uh, Patrick, but um, you know, it's, it's uh, something that we asked in the, in the last round of the regional health survey is, and when we were looking at the cancer pathways survivorship work, is a lot of First Nations um, actually don't have GPs. And so um, the utilization of the ED department, um, because there are no primary care networks or no doctors maybe within the community um, and they don't have a general practitioner, um, the ED is your alternative or the urgent care clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's an important piece of context for understanding, for providers to understand. And so we also heard perspectives on how the ED experience can be changed. So there was a desire for providers to know colonial history and contemporary determinants of health. There was a desire for equity approaches. So not just equal approaches, not treating everyone the same, but to know that if someone's had past negative experiences, and given that there are stereotypes around, for instance, alcohol and substance use, things may need to be approached differently in the care interaction. So the example could be not saying, you know, when did you have your last drink, which implies a person is drinking, um, but prefacing, you know, this is a question we would ask of anyone who has certain symptoms, there's medical reasons for this, and we'll see how one physician was putting that into practice in a future quote. Let's also talk about the need for ethical spaces. So this is Elder Willie Ermine's idea, and you could read his article of coming together, and I think Bonnie will do this better justice than me, but understanding that our histories are shared and intertwined, and we can come together to, to improve things. And people talked about our gathering where we had administrators and physicians as you know, a possible um, example of doing that. Um, I, yeah, I, I, maybe I can share some experiences on how you achieve uh, a safe ethical space is um, when I've had to negotiate some hard things and with the great guidance and support of um, Willie Ermine, who has um, done his dissertation on this, um, on this important understanding is um, and I first used it actually when I was sitting on an ethics board because there was, you know, um, very little understanding of, an, of a First Nations worldview. But uh, I would um, work with government uh, partners or, or Western academia partners and say there is going to be policies and legislation that is not going to be conducive of building a respectful relationship that's going to respect things like OCAP, like our, an, an alternative worldview, or um, understanding Indigenous methodologies of research, um, or the, the understanding of the cultural um, and spiritual needs uh, and protocols that need to be followed with, with, with each other. And so simple things like feeding people um, and feasting and giving tobacco um, and, and owning intellectual property. So all of these things um, get complicated. And uh, so what I usually do is just tell people to remove those things from the space and let's get to know each other as human beings, like a human to human relationship and get to really under, you know, get to know about each other and and build that relationship and then get to that place of building that safe ethical space and that long-term relationship that um, Willie Ermine is addressing in his dissertation. And then, and then we heard about systemic approaches to addressing racism, that it's not about finding the case where racism happened, proving that an individual has behaved in a racist manner, 
Um, I mean, that puts things into a very like a quasi legal or judicial framework where there has to be proof. But about, you know, if we acknowledge that there is racism, what do we do about it? And so we have some suggested practical steps for providers. So treating each patient as a unique individual, not making assumptions about the group someone belongs to, conducting complete investigations at each ED visit, learning about stereotypes and biases to self-correct, learning about history and colonialism, and including locally so that the situation across Canada is not the same, the situation across Alberta for different First Nations communities is not the same. So recognizing that resources outside the ED are not always the same, avoiding blaming patients for what you might perceive as not the right use of the emergency department. Recognizing that stereotypes can be activated regardless of what you intend, and that there are past negative experiences with healthcare among First Nations people. So it can be possible to modify the approach and care plan accordingly. And then also thinking about children's services. We know 70% of children in Alberta are Indigenous, according to the Child and Youth Advocate. So how much does that start in the emergency department? It's not something we know, but it's, it's worth thinking about. An example of modifying approach is a quote from a physician we interviews. And he says that he'll preface things. So in addition to the medical questions I need to ask about other, I'll say I need to ask about other things that could impact patient care or impact your health, such as smoking and drinking. And he says one strategy is asking permission to ask. So it's an example. He says he doesn't know if it's perfect, this physician, but it's an example. And practical steps for departments. So not just putting the burden entirely on providers. That's a recipe for burnout. Um, taking for granted that racism impacts health and health care. Looking at policies and practices that could support equitable care. So that could be looking at discharge pathways. Are people getting um, appointments at times or in places that they aren't able to go to? and then creating safe and well-moderated learning opportunities to address anti-Indigenous stereotypes and racism, um, which would need to involve First Nations professionals and educators. And we're also suggesting that departments could build formal relationships with First Nations communities to familiarize providers with the realities that First Nations patients face and the resources that are available outside the emergency department and to enable the emergency department to understand and work to address the expectations that the community or the community health services have for emergency care. Some research shows that standardized triage, care and discharge pathways do reduce uh, discrepancies in care or inequities. But there need to be processes for reporting discriminatory behavior and restorative follow up so not that not that someone reports and then everyone knows they reported and there's bad relationships within the department, but that things can be reported and the reporter protected and that the department can address it in a holistic way. And then emergency departments, because they have that public health role and see where the gaps are, can be incredibly important advocates for resources and quality improvement efforts at a systemic level inside the ED and outside the ED. And that's, that's the end for my comments. And I'd invite you, Bonnie. Yeah, I've been trying to um, answer some of the questions within the Q&A as you've been going along, Patrick. So I've provided some um, responses. But, um, you know, I think one of the questions was, um, really, how can we, um, uh, where did I answer it? It, it was along the lines of some practical steps on how we can resolve um, or move forward to really create safe spaces in, in these systems of care. And one of the things that Patrick and I talked about a few days ago is possibly looking at um, developing where we collectively work together in all of us, you know, not just the First Nations driving the work, but working to, together in a collective uh, true partnership um, to develop something similar to what the Maori have done, and that's a health equity framework. And I know that I've worked with um, individuals within AHS, and we've talked about this over the years, 
Um, but this is a beginning, it's a start, I think, to create true system change. There's many things at play, the, the Indian Act, the um, First Nations Health Policy, you know, um, uh, on the First Nations side, upholding the spirit and intent of the uh, treaty relationship and um, having, you know, uh, Canada um, collective as a whole understand what that, that initial promise was on how to live um, uh, together, um, uh, similar to, I think, you know, how the um, Mohawk um, understood the relationship is we have parallel paths, we coexist, we don't interfere with each other. And so we don't try and dominate each other with one worldview over the other. So you'll you see a lot of these system changes starting to occur. It's slow, but um, it is, there is a beginning. And uh, I think it's the commitment to want to be better and want to, you know, to to provide that care to all human beings, regardless of, of race, and that anybody that walks into that space uh, receives the care that they walked in to receive and they get it. But also, too, even looking at individuals that work in the ED department space, um, you know, some systems, uh, system change needs to also go on within. I know that when I experienced my first case of burnout with my 30 year nursing um, experience, it was actually from the ED department. And um, there was a level of disconnect that I myself went through where I could, couldn't have emotion, I couldn't have feeling, anxiety or stress because I was um, technically trying to get through all of my a uh, trauma pathway to save that human being's life. And so my tears and my emotion and my anxiety had no place in that room. And, um, but that level of disconnect that I practiced every day when I walked into that space, it actually came over into my home life. And when I first noticed that it had a negative impact on me is when I was unable to feel my 14 year old daughter as she was having a breakdown. <laughs> And so I did a lot of work on myself, a lot of self-care, a lot of work with my elders, a lot of uh, support and guidance uh, in our own ways on how to reconnect. And, and that's maybe something that, uh, you know, we can look at and, and work on supporting those that work in those spaces. Thank you so much, Bonnie and Patrick, um, for this very, very important conversation today. Uh, I know we have a number of questions. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for trying to stay on top of the questions. And I've been putting links to some of the resources into the chat box as well, where people have requested them. Um, so we do have a lot of questions. I'll try to get to some, um, but knowing that anything that hasn't been answered will be followed up on as well. And I think um, there's some really important questions here about this idea of, of restorative justice and, and some tips for people who are working in clinical settings right now. And I think, um, I did notice a couple of comments about what about these experiences in other populations and won't people who live who are experiencing homelessness experience discrimination in emergency departments and what about people who use drugs and come into the emergency departments and I think the important thing to remember in these discussions is what we're actually talking about is the, the racism that people experience interpersonally but systemically and for Indigenous people those will be a result of big systemic legislative, historical, contemporary, um, inequitable systems, right? That if you are homeless and indigenous and you go to the first and, and you go to the emergency room, and then that's an extra layer um, of, of harm as a result of racism as well. So important things to think about. Um, I think there is a good question here as far as um, the, the action points. I think that's, it's really it's really great to focus on action and asking if, if Bonnie and Patrick, you could speak more to restorative follow-up after discriminatory behavior. So how can managers support and facilitate this? I think it's, um, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do um, in really helping to build up um, an understanding, even on the First Nation side, um, knowing that there's a place that they can go to, um, like an ombudsman or, you know, a neutral place, a safe space, you know, that um, can hear them, can listen to them, and, and really work together in a mediation type 
you know, space to understand, you know, where things went wrong and how things can um, be different and ensuring that care is um, continued um, and that outcomes are improved. Yeah, and I don't think I could, could do more than that. Thank you. Thank you both. And I'm trying to I see a few questions um, that maybe I can try to, to roll into one, but this idea of representation, and we know that one of the, the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Act is to actually have more Indigenous, more, more First Nations, Métis and Inuit um, healthcare workers, healthcare providers um, in systems that are designed by Indigenous people. And talking about representation, how uh, can our medical and, and healthcare professional training institutes, that's where we are, um, how do we create better systems to, to fill that gap and have more, and not only recruit, but retain more Indigenous healthcare providers? I guess, so there are more and more Indigenous nurses and physicians all the time. I think that's important to recognize. So 10 years from now, hopefully you won't have this presentation or kind of presentation from someone who looks like me. Um, but I think there's a real role for Indigenous led health services, I think. And a question I have is, so there's been some really exciting examples of Indigenous led um, maternal care organizations or primary care focused clinics, what would indigenous led emergency services look like? How would it be structured differently? Um, if there are hospitals, and we know there are, so there's hospitals that serve high proportions of indigenous persons, what's the role for community governance at those hospitals? Um, are things I think are, are interesting directions things could go and uh, interested in your thoughts, Bonnie. Yeah, I, I um... Sorry, I'm not using my video because my internet is lagging, so you get to see my logo. But uh, uh, the, you know, I think that um, looking at Indigenous-led services or where we are more visible or active players, I think at all levels of the health system, um, I think are necessary. But, um, you know, I, I can just look at maybe one in my home community of the Blood Tribe and Rita still on the phone with us, but there is a, a bringing the spirit home. It's a detox run center, um, and their data is actually phenomenal. So it's a culturally it's a it's a culturally focused detox center that supports people in an opioid addiction, and um, they've been able to see a success rate as high as thirty percent of really changing people's lives and getting them back on a pathway. Um, uh, some even uh, graduating or getting it back into university and, and um, making it through. Um, but, you know, when I was working on the downtown east side of Vancouver uh, for about a decade um, in the um, late, around 97 to about the early 2000s, the data that um, I saw of people getting out of addictions alive was less than 2.5%. And so to see a success rate of 30% and really working from that cultural framework um, and that block foot framework. And when I looked at it a bit deeper with the group, a lot of their work is about reconnection. And so really working through those traumas without substance and supporting people on that reconnection journey to their, and in this case, to their block foot self. And so having that complete support of system of the elders, of the culture, of, of the caretakers, all coming from the same community has really contributed to a great success rate of, of healthier and better outcomes that are unseen anywhere else. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And that speaks to such a wonderful point around self-determination um, for improving health. So I am very conscious that we um, need to give up our Zoom platform right now. Um, and I really, really want to thank again, Patrick and Bonnie and all of our attendees and the O'Brien Institute and GRIP uh, for hosting this really, really important discussion. Your questions will get passed on, um, not to worry. And for anyone who's interested, we're so lucky to have um, people like Patrick and Bonnie with, with these skills and being able to, to really move and push this work forward um, with these provincial connections.
and any further events um, that as, as the GRIP activities kind of coalesce with the Indigenous Primary Healthcare and Policy Research Network activities, you can head again on over to uh, iphcpr.ca um, for any more information on our events. And with that, I say merci and thank you um, to our presenters and to uh, our attendees. And I look forward to more of these conversations in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.